Hey everybody, welcome to Vim Chicago. Uh, we've got a lectern, so now we're, uh, we're getting really professional. A um, couple of quick announcements to start off. We have uh, Wi-Fi in the office on a guest network. Uh, the username is satellite, the password is that's no moon if you need to connect. Uh, a couple of quick uh, announcements. I think I'm gonna turn the lights on. It's gonna get dark here. A couple of quick announcements. Um, first of all, uh, this event sponsored by HashRocket, where uh, several of us work. And um, I just want to say thanks to HashRocket. And uh, they provide the pizza. They provide the location. It's a, um, so we're a um, web development and mobile consultancy headquartered in Jacksonville, Florida. And it's a really um, awesome company. So if you have any interest in working for us or working with us, uh, please talk to somebody who works here. We're always looking for good people. Um, also, a couple of uh, plugs for this meetup. Um, we are always looking for speakers. Right now, the month of July is open and onward. So we meet every third Tuesday. Um, and we would love to get someone to speak in July and, and onward. And it's really exciting when it's somebody who's not an employee of HashRocket. So um, uh, just throw that out there. Please contact me or Josh or Chris, and we can help you develop your idea into a talk. So next month, we have Chris. Uh, on May 17th, Chris Aaron will be giving a talk, uh, Deep Sea Dive into Vim Unimpaired. Um, I'm putting you on the spot. <laughs> Uh, June 21st, David Colgan will be giving a talk on my client gave me data on a Word doc, cleaning up messy text with Vim. And uh, on July 19th, could be you. Uh, uh, recently, we did some lightning talks and they were really fun. Um, so I think we're going to do that again, maybe like twice a year. But it's not a big step, I don't think, from going from a 10 minute lightning talk to a 30 minute full-time talk, so it's, it's something that you can do if you'd like. Okay, let's get started. Okay, I'd like to start with a quote. If I had eight hours to chop down a tree, I'd spend six hours sharpening my ax. Has anyone heard this quote before? Um, it kind of coincides with an idea um, f that I've read in a couple of places called sharpening the saw. Um, People who are ineffective will, when they're given a task, they'll get immediately into brute forcing it uh, with as much elbow grease as they can muster, but they uh, won't perhaps stop and look at the tools they have. And one thing that I really enjoy about working at HashRocket is that we spend a lot of time talking about tools. Uh, we're, very, um, we're very nerdy about them, and we're willing to entertain anybody's crazy idea about changing any of our tools. Nothing's kind of off the table. If it works, then we're, we're willing to give it a try. Uh, so in my opinion, better tools equal better work. And a small amount of time invested in your tools is going to make you a lot more effective. So with that in mind, this is my talk, Dive into Vim Language Plugins. My name is Jake Wirth. I'm a developer at HashRocket. I also co-organize this meetup, Vim Chicago. All these slides are on GitHub if you want to check them out so you don't have to worry about uh, copying down a URL. Can you see okay? Okay, cool. Um, you don't have to worry about copying them down because they're all available online. So, I have a problem. I have a really big problem, and that is that I have created a fictional programming language that's called Emerald. Um, and so, this is Emerald programming language. Um, it's object oriented, it's really powerful and fast. I'm just going to show you a little bit of code, but trust me, it's really great. Um, Ruby is known as a programmer's best friend, so since that was taken, Emerald is a programmer's best pal. Um, uh, so quickly, I'll, I'll show an example of some code in this programming language. Okay, so we start off with a comment. Uh, a comment is indicated by these two dashes, and this programmer is written woot. Uh, because they're having so much fun with this programming language. It's like so fun and easy that that's the only thing that they can think of to possibly say. Um, so we're going down the file here. Uh, we have some white space. Now we're getting to our first reserve keyword, which is funk. This is how you uh, s 
say the, uh, a function is starting, the same as the def keyword in Ruby. Um, then we're, we'll follow that by the method name. So uh, Emerald uses snake case for method names. So this is also um, a important keyword. We drop down a line and we're, we're indented four spaces, um, like Ruby, instead of two, it's four. And we're gonna call uh, our first sort of macro method, which is the printed method. And this will print something to the screen. Then we have a string argument that accepts hello world, followed by an inline comment. So we, that's something we support too. Uh, dropping down a line, we have the end reserve keyword, which closes out the method. Okay, so now we have another method. This is called return one. So we're hitting another reserve keyword here, which is the return keyword. Uh, so that's supported. And we also support um, integers as a data type. Uh, one, then we hit the end keyword and that finishes that method. Okay, so one final method, this is return true. It has an explicit return and it's gonna return true, which is a Boolean. So that's a third uh, data type that the language supports. And um, there's a really big problem here. I wrote this language and I wanna use it in Vim, but because it's so bleeding edge and out there, Vim does not support my language. So here's an example. Uh, I'm opening up this function to type some new code. And because of the four space indentation, I would expect uh, you know, to be start four spaces. But I don't. I start uh, at, at zero, so that's terrible. Um, there's no syntax highlighting, right? Like every word looks the same. Um, I have no kind of motions that help me do things quickly. Um, so this is a really desperate bad situation. And uh, my problem is that I can't edit in the programming language I wrote in Vim. And I'm so frustrated and desperate that I'm thinking of maybe switching to Emacs or Sublime Text or some other <laughs> programming language. So if you know this meetup, you know that uh, that's not going to work. And I want to try to find uh, something I can, some way I can make Vim work for me. So the tool that I'm going to want to solve this is called a Vim language plugin. Uh, so this is my definition of a Vim language plugin. It is a plugin that helps you write and read code in a specific language. If you've used Vim for a while, you know that there are a lot that already exist. Um, real quickly, I'd like to go around the room and just have everybody introduce yourself and also tell me what your, uh, your like main language that you write in is. I'll start, I'm Jake. I mostly write in Ruby. And also I work here at Hashrocket, as you know. How about you, Paul? Uh, my name's Paul Haddad. I work at Yellow and work in Ruby. Cool. Uh, I'm Scott. I'm, uh, I'm a graduate student in USC. I'm mostly writing, uh, I'm just a new user. I'm, I, I, I don't write pros um, much. Cool. Um, I'm Chris. I work, I work here at Hashrocket and I do Ruby in them mostly. Uh, my name is Daniel. I work for a startup called and I use Vim for JavaScript. Yeah. Cool. I'm Shailene, and uh, I use Python and C++. Uh, and from Northwestern University, and I do machine learning and computer vision. Cool. I'm Josh. I work here at Hashrocket, and I think I actually probably write uh, more Markdown <laughs> than, <laughs> than I do Ruby or JavaScript. David, and I primarily use Python and CopyScript. Awesome. So we got uh, a pretty good representation of different languages here. Um, I didn't hear any language that I don't know of there being at least one really good Vim plugin for. So that's a good sign for um, moving forward. Um, this is a look into my Vim bundle. I use Vim Pathogen to manage my Vim plugins. It's a really great project for your dependencies. Uh, some people here also like bundle, um, whatever works for you. Uh, I use Vim Pathogen, so I ran ls on, this is a conventional place that uh, your Vim plugins are stored if you use Vim Pathogen. It's this uh, .vim slash bundle directory, and this is just the stuff that came back that was language related plugins that I have, mostly that I have installed. Uh, so I have support for C, Elm, Idris, Rust, Vim, Elixir, Factor, Go, JavaScript, Markdown, and Ruby. And I probably missed a couple too. Um, if you like to experiment with languages like I do, then you probably have a lot of these too. Um, 
and those were all really easy to install with Pathogen. So I think this is pretty representative of what like a typical Vim user's uh, directory structure might look like. So these are the top three language plugins from vim.org. Um, this site here is, uh, is a directory that's on the vim.org site. I talked about it last month at a lightning talk. You can use to search. You have to be listed there. It doesn't like go out and find all the plugins, but um, most of the plugins are listed there. It's a really good resource. So number one, c.vim, uh, not surprising. Number two, python.vim. I included rails.vim as a, as a number three. Uh, rails is a, obviously a DSL, but um, I, I think it falls into the category of a language plugin. So that was um, the top three, and I don't think there were any other, there might have been an, another C, but it was mostly, that rounded out the top 20. So there's lots of really popular plugins that are not language plugins. We already, already talked about what your pr primary languages uh, were, so we're gonna skip that. Um, so language plugins share behavior. No matter what your plugin is, there's uh, some things in common that they all do. And let's check those out. Okay, so this is the stuff that a, a language plugin library, uh, they're all going to share. Number one is file type detection. This is the entry point for the plugin uh, into giving you functionality because the plugin will tell Vim this is a Ruby file or this is a JavaScript file. And it has to be able to do that in order for any of the other behavior to work. So that's the most important uh, entry point into the, uh, into the functionality. Secondly, we have syntax highlighting. Uh, so we have syntax highlighting going on in this file right now. As you can see, the, the bar in the bottom, this is a markdown file. Since I have Vim Markdown installed, uh, it's made the header, the H1, uh, purple, and it's made the bullets orange, and it uh, doesn't really do a whole lot more than that with the stuff that I have on screen. Syntax highlighting is obviously really useful. Um, then we've got automatic indentation. That's something I was pointing out on that emerald uh, file, example file, uh, expecting some indentation to happen automatically. Then we're gonna get some commands and mappings for doing powerful things in the language. And uh, lastly, you will get autom autocomplete of some of the uh, important keywords in that language. So today we're gonna be doing something I call a source dive into Vim Ruby. Um, Vim Ruby, Ruby may not be your language of choice, but I hope that this slide kind of illustrates that there's a lot in common between these plugins. And it's all Vim script, so uh, one plugin is not going to be very much different from another one as far as uh, the general architecture. Beware, Vim script ahead. Uh, who's familiar with Vim script? A little bit? Okay. Vim script is the language that uh, gives commands to Vim. It's um, different looking than some programming languages you may have encountered before. Uh, some people find it challenging. This is my first time ever really trying to read Vim script. So uh, I tried to dig into it and hopefully you can follow along with uh, what I learned and, and it, you could help you possibly learn Vim script as well. But it's a, it's, it's a, ch it's a challenging language at some t sometimes. So let's take a look uh, at Vim Ruby. All right, so this is the structure of Vim Ruby. To start off, it is hosted on GitHub, uh, user Vim Ruby slash Vim Ruby. Um, as I said, I manage my plugins with the um, Pathogen tool, so uh, there, this is actually copied locally to my machine. And um, one thing I like to do is run the tree command uh, when, I, when I'm looking at a new project to take a look at the structure of a project. So we'll do that now. Um, this is kind of chopped off, but the, the top, stuff at the top is mostly documentation. Um, the last five uh, directories are really the important functional parts of the plugin. FT detect is your file type detect library. That is uh, the entry point that you need for everything else to work. Then you've got the FT plugin, which is a file type plugin, and that is um, where the bulk of the functionality of Vim Ruby lies. Then we've got a indent directory, We've got our spec directory and we have syntax. So uh, those, th those handle the different parts of how it works. Um, another thing I like to do with a new project is look at the first commit, just because I was a history major and I find this stuff like very interesting. So uh, we're gonna CD into that directory. Um, this is like a trick, like a hack that I posted on our, our daily learning site, TIL, but it's basically gonna show the uh, the first commit that doesn't have a parent, which will be the oldest commit in the project. Um, so here we are. 
Uh, the author was Gavin Sinclair, and the date was June 27, 2003. So this has been around for quite some time. Uh, there's a lot of README stuff. It's talking about Vim Ruby Ruby Forge project, so predating GitHub, I think is that that's what that means. Um, and it's basically like a giant initial commit for the project. Um, so this has been for, around for a long time. Uh, it's you know it's older than Rails. Um, CD back. How do you run that command? Sure. Um, so basically, what I'm doing here, uh, the command itself is. Uh, do you have any questions about the command or just how I'm running it? No. How are you run, Are you pressing K or? Yeah. So the way that I run it is I have um, vimrc. Let's see. I have a mapping in my vimrc. Local. Uh -huh. And um, it basically takes whatever is underneath the buffer of the current word and it executes it. Uh, sorry, it's actually in a local, um, I forgot that it's actually in a local VMRC to this directory. E dot VMRC. Yeah, so we have a normal mode remap of the F2 key to colon x, which is execute, and then get line of the current line, and then press enter. Um, so that will take anything that is a vim command, and it will uh, execute it. Thanks. Yeah, um, it was, that was fun trying to set that up. So let's take a look uh, at some more at vim Ruby's features. Uh, so like I said, the first entry point is file type detection. And um, this is defined in the ft detect li uh, directory, which is part of the, the Vim Ruby library. Uh, and the conventional thing is to have a file in each of those directories with the name of the language. So this file is ruby.vim. So we're going to jump to line 8 of that file. Um, and this is how the file type detection works. Uh, so as I said, this is Vim script. Um, we start off with au, which means run the command automatically. And then that's followed by whatever event you want it to happen automatically on. The f so we're using two events here. The first is buff new file, and the second is buff read. So buff new file is a new file in the buffer. Buff read is reading an existing file into the buffer. Then we match that with uh, whatever file names we want. So we're doing anything.rb, anything.rbw, and anything.gemspec. If any of those are matched, we're going to call this method setfruby, uh, which is defined at the top of this file. So this is where the method is defined, set f Ruby. It takes a file type as an argument. Uh, then we use the abort keyword. That's if there's any error, just abort. Um, if the file type is not set, then set it to whatever that argument was for the file type. Um, and this is a pretty long file. It goes, down, it goes on and on and on. So it, it does uh, Rails files. It does rake files, rant files, IRB files, pry files. Pry is a really great Ruby debugger that we use a lot here. Um, I can't really recommend highly enough. So with just this file, a whole, see if it all, uh, with just this file, a whole universe of Ruby related files are going to be recognized and they're going to, uh, this plugin is going to tell Vim this is a Ruby file. Okay, so that was file type detection. Uh, continuing on with Vim Ruby features, next thing we have is syntax highlighting. Uh, so this is going to look at your protected keywords like def and end and give them special highlighting. Then we have access modifier indentation. Uh, Ruby has special keywords called access modifiers, public, protected, and private. And the way that they are indented is uh, some, somewhat not completely agreed upon, but there's different ways to do it. And this plugin will support any way you choose to do it. Uh, we have commands and mappings. These are known as Ruby motions and Ruby text objects. And we have autocomplete. OK, so I'd like to do a quick demo of what you get with Vim Ruby. Um, one thing you can do that is really cool uh, if you want to see what Ruby looks like with no plugins is you can run Vim. And then dash u tells it what, what's coming after this is uh, the VimRC that I want to use or the configuration file that I want to use. And then you just say none. So this will tell it, don't load up any of my uh, Vim configuration, which will include loading any of my plugins. And uh, if you do that, 
you're going to get uh, Vim in its purest form. And that, that includes plugins that come with Vim, like standard Vim plugins. It's pretty useless, actually. <laughs> um, so this is a, I want to do a, a quick demo of what you get with Vim Ruby. So we're going to start off by doing vnew, and we're going to just create a new file in the buffer. This is my like, sort of hacky way of getting around Vim Ruby. Um, because it's not a Ruby file, uh, file type detection is not going to happen. And we're not going to know, Vim's not going to know that it is a Ruby file. So we'll start writing some Ruby. Foo. OK, so already we have a problem, right? There's no syntax highlighting. Uh, there was no automatic indentation. It didn't close the method. If you've used Vim Ruby before, you would expect to see all that. OK. And so there is the end of our method. Um, we have no file type detection. We have no syntax highlighting, no indentation, no commands and mappings. Um, we'll get in, into what that actually means in a, in a few minutes. And we have no autocomplete. Um, if we want to see all that stuff in action, all we have to do is write the file with any of those .rb recognized extensions. So if we just write it with .rb, Vim Ruby should recognize this. Because we're reading a new file into the buffer, what we just looked at, Vim Ruby should recognize this as a Ruby file. And it should do all the things. So now we have syntax highlighting. Uh, if we open a new line, we, I would expect this to be indented two spaces. Right. And it is. Um, and everything is highlighted nicely. So um, you also get some Vim motions. Um, uh, an example would be like VAM is going to, uh, in visual mode, surround whatever method you're in. That's a Vim motion. Uh, VIM is going to do the inner method. And then there's a capital uh, letter version of that that works just for classes. So you kind of get a sense of what the uh, Vim Ruby offers you. OK, um, now for some deeper diving into more Vim script. OK, so Ruby motions, as I just was talking about, Ruby motions help you move around. Um, this is a list. Um, I'm, don't, I'm not going to go too into detail with this because I don't particularly find these that useful, but I think that some people uh, may use them all the time. But uh, if you do, for instance, an open bracket M, that's going to go to the start of the next method definition. So these are ways for that you can rapidly jump around a Ruby file. Um, these types of mappings already exist for all the curly uh, bracket languages, but Vim Ruby had to implement it because uh, Vim didn't provide that stuff out of the box. So if we want to see uh, how this is set up, we need to go to line 165 of that same um, FT plugin file. Actually, I don't think we've been in this one yet. We were in FT detect. So uh, let's check that out. OK, so here we are uh, where all this remapping is happen happening. Uh, we start off with an N no remap. Uh, so I kind of glossed over it before, but remapping takes uh, one key and maps it to another key in Vim. Um, and there's different kinds of remaps. So this is an endno remap, and that, that means it is a normal mode only remap. Um, if you're kind of newer to Vim, uh, you, you, probably, you may not be totally familiar with the modes, but it's, it's a really key part of uh, the text editor. So then we uh, have the silent flag. That says, don't write any output to the message bar in the bottom. Then we have the buffer flag, which says uh, that we are working on the current buffer. So this is where the remapping actually starts. We have a closed square M. So this is what we have. And then what comes after is what we want. Uh, what we want is a colon. Then we do control U, which wipes out any automatically generated range that Vim will put in. Sometimes if you have like multiple lines, Vim will put a range uh, after, the, after a colon. And we want to get rid of that. Then we call the method. Uh, then we hit this SID keyword. Um, which is used by Vim to, to designate the script as local only. It's not a global. Uh, it can't be used globally. It's to try to limit the like, collateral damage of defining this. Then we call this uh, search sin method. And this takes four arguments. This is also defined in this file. The arguments are what you want to match, then any alias. So we use Ruby defined as an alias. Uh, then any possible flag, and then what mode you want. And then you hit Enter. So 
to put all that together, if somebody does a close bracket M, Vim is going to call this command, which is going to search, uh, we, which is defined elsewhere in the file, uh, but we'll kind of go uh, skip past that for now. So we're, it's going to search for the next DEF keyword, which is the beginning of a method definition. And it's going to do that with a B flag, which is backwards. So it's going to go up to the previous method definition. I lost my timer. Um, if anybody, I, I neglected to mention, if anybody has questions or wants to um, dig deeper into this stuff, please let me know. But um, I'm giving the best possible explanation that I uh, know how to do. But we could definitely stop and, and go further if anyone would like to. OK, so that is your Ruby motions. Next, we have Ruby text objects. These are really something that I, I like a lot. Um, AM, IM, A big M, and I big M. The two that I demonstrated earlier were AM and IM. And these are composable. So you can use like a, a DIM or a VIM or any other of the normal mode commands. And you can pair them up with these to do actions on the inner part of a method, the outer part of a method, the inner part of a class, or an outer part of a class. I think these are really cool. Um, so in that same file on line 188 is where we de define uh, that functionality. OK. It back into the uh, Vim script. OK, so this is an operator remap. That means that uh, it is supposed to be followed by a command that the operator is entered. Again, silent and buffer. Um, we're going to be connecting whatever command was entered by the operator followed by IM to a colon where we will wipe out the range. And then we will call a method using the SID keyword, which uh, again designated that it's a local, not global method. We we'll call a method that's defined elsewhere in this file called wrap i, and um, that takes two arguments: the beginning and the end. Um, and it's kind of cool here; they're actually using the the marks that we've already defined elsewhere as uh, the indicators for where the wrapping is to begin and end. So square bracket m. If we're doing inner method, square bracket m would be the top of the method, and close bracket big M would be an end keyword, I think. Uh, so you're wrapping inside of that. And then if you do AM, it's the same exact thing, but it's a different method wrap around, which doesn't just exclude those uh, keywords. It also includes the keywords. So um, yes? Who defines wrap I and wrap A? Yes, let's check it out. Who it in the Ruby bin itself? No, they are defined here. Set and U. So they're defined on line 310. Uh -oh. they, they take a back and a forward keyword. Oh, so they are in Ruby bin. Yes, they are in this, this okay. plugin. Um, this is about as far down as I got in my personal dive. But um, this method is uh, the, the wrap I and the wrap A method are what actually wrap those things in visual mode. OK, now we have access mod modifier indentation. Access modifier indentation uh, kind of tackles this somewhat controversial, although not so much anymore, uh, discussion in Ruby about how you indent the access modifier keywords, public, which doesn't really get used much, protected, and private. Um, normal is the default. And if we look at in the indent library on line 16, we can see where that's defined. Um, so basically, if something is not set uh, as a global Ruby indent access modifier style, then let that style be normal. Um, and there's a lot more to how that actually works. But um, I think this is kind of maybe something that we can move past a little more quickly, because it's not. Um, it's not something that I think is, is really discussed as much in Ruby style guides. I think uh, there is sort of one agreed upon style, but uh, feel free to come talk to me if you have a different opinion. But we'll look at uh, what those three styles are in the next slide. OK, so this is what normal indentation looks like. We have our class, and then we have this public keyword. Um, 
and then we have a method. The method is on the same indentation as the public keyword. Then protected is followed, we follow it with another method as an example, and that is again two spaces. So everything is two spaces in normal. Um, this is how I would write a Ruby class. Um, and it's not uh, the only way that you can get a working Ruby class, but that's how I would do it. Uh, so these are the two other options. So with indent method or methods are indented inside the access control keyword. So that would look like this. Um, okay, outdent access control keywords are not indented inside of the classes. So that would look like that. Um, so those are two different ways that you can actually do the style. Uh, again, I think normal mode is preferred. Syntax highlighting. Uh, syntax highlighting is great. Syntax highlighting helps make your code easier to read and to write. And there's a lot of def there's a lot of examples we could look at for this, but I uh, have chosen to look at Boolean because you had to pick. I had to pick something. Um, so if we look on line 216, we're going to see where the syntax highlighting is defined, and then on line 336, we will see where how it is assigned for Vim use. So uh, this is where it's assigned. Um, we tell Vim that this is a syntax match, and then we uh, match is going to take a two arguments: the thing that the the keyword that you're going to match, and the thing that you want to match it to. Um, and at this point, a lot of the other keywords have already been defined, which this comment helpfully points out. Um, so we're going to take the keyword Ruby Boolean, which is just uh, a convenience variable defined by this plugin. It's not doesn't mean anything to Vim. And then it's going to match this regex, uh, which is true or false. And you can see that is happening for a couple of uh, other things too. So we have Ruby keyword super and yield. Um, Ruby pseudo variable. Oh, that's pretty cool. Nil, self. Um, so it's taking whatever is inside that regex and it's, uh, it's going to match it to these keywords that we've assigned. Then if we jump down farther into the file, um, this is where the actual assignment happens. So this is a highlight default link between the variable we assigned and a variable that Vim recognizes. Uh, so Vim knows uh, what a Boolean and a float and a character and a number are and it has its own rules for what those should be colored like in every co possible color scheme you have. So what you're doing is you're telling, what this file basically does is tells Vim in this language, this is what a Boolean looks like. In this language, this is what an integer looks like or a control statement. And that allows Vim to attempt to properly highlight the code in a way that is readable. Okay, so back to my problem. Um, I don't know if you guys recall, but I was in agony earlier because of this programming language I wrote uh, that I, I can't edit properly. Um, a few more specs about the Emerald programming language. So Emerald has some reserve keywords, uh, as I mentioned. It has funct, print it, end, and return. And then we support two primitive types, strings and booleans. And lastly, we have comments. And the comments are uh, indicated by two dashes. And we support block and inline. So ideally, as a client, I would be, you know, I want to have all the functionality that a Vim plugin provides. But uh, for the sake of demonstration, I'm going to focus on just implementing the syntax highlighting uh, part of what a Vim plugin would do, because um, I think that's pretty interesting. So. Once again, here's our file. Uh, we have no syntax highlighting at all. And to try to address this, I wrote like a very basic Vim plugin. Um, so the convention is emerald.vim or whatever your language is, .vim for the name of your plugin. And this is just one file. Uh, so we start off with a header. And you say it's a Vim syntax file or whatever kind of file it is. And then you say the language, the maintainer, and the latest revision, which was today. Uh, so then we have this if. And um, this is checking if any current syntax is set. 
And if it is, uh, just bail. Closed out by an end if. So um, here we are. Uh, I'm actually going to be doing those assignments the same way as happened in Vim Ruby. So I want to say that a um, keyword, as key keyword assignment of Vim is a little bit different. You can do it like in line. Vim is aware of keywords and they're um, like a, a core part of Vim's functionality. So um, this is a pattern Vim Ruby used and it's similar to what, to what I used. Um, so I, I do a syntax match of keyword to Emerald keyword. And, I, and here I've listed all the protected keywords uh, for the language. There's only five of them, which is nice. Um, okay, so then I want to match strings. So I'm going to do a syntax region match. Region can match more than one word. It can match uh, collections of words or multiple lines. And uh, I tell it where, where it starts. It starts on a double, double quote and it ends on a double quote. And um, then I say contained, which I think, I believe limits it to, um, this will allow for like an empty string to be properly highlighted because I'm saying contained nothing. Um, so if, as long as it starts and ends with that, even if there's nothing inside of it, uh, this region is considered an emerald string. Uh, do the same thing, but without the contain, which should capture uh, multiple words. Then we match Booleans, uh, and, and I'm assigning them to the term Emerald Boolean. And we match integers. So I want to match uh, any number of digits, and then I also want to match with a plus and minus to capture uh, if we're putting that in front of the number. Then I want to match the Emerald Comment. So I will do two dashes followed by anything and end of a line. That should hopefully allow for inline comments and uh, standalone comments just that are on their own line. Then we uh, set the syntax. And we say that the current syntax is emerald. And that's very important because after the file type detection has been put in place, that will tell Vim this is the file I want to use. So lastly, we take the things we've assigned and we link them to things that Vim knows about. So for each of these lines, we're doing a highlight default link between our variables and the variables that Vim is aware of. OK. So I have skipped over the file type detection because that is something that uh, is determined by the Vim knows where to look for that file based off your directory structure. If you look at a, a typical Vim plugin, like the one, the Vim Ruby, Ruby plugin that we looked at, uh, it has a hierarchy including a, an FT detect directory, and Vim will look there uh, for that knowledge. So I'm going to set that manually. Um, right now it's set to nothing, so I'm going to set it to Emerald. Okay, so now um, FT detect could have done that automatically, but I did it manually. You can see that it's an Emerald file. So now if we source my file. Okay, thank you, thank you. Uh, so we just started writing stuff, right? This is a comment. Um, print it, any, any of the keywords, string, it worked. Okay. Um, so that is my uh, five-minute introduction to writing a, a Vim plugin. And if you start reading any of this code, any of the code, you'll see that it's just kind of that level of difficulty done over multiple files and in a very thoughtful way. Um, so it's something that I think anybody could do if, if they uh, put their mind to it. Some additional thoughts. All right, this is a quote that I got kind of off of the internet, but I tried to scrub it to like anonymize it. Um, Terminal-based <laughs> terminal text editors take a lot of time and en energy to learn and maintain. Simpler options have been available for years now, e.g. Sublime. And um, this was like a, this is a very standard argument against uh, these terminal-based text editors like Vim. Um, is that they're really complicated and they take forever to set up. And why, not, why don't you just use something like Sublime that you install it and it offers immediate, immediate support for any language that you want to edit? And I would counter that with a couple of points. First of all, check out every text editor. This is a Vim meetup and we, we preach the gospel of Vim. 
but that shouldn't stop you from trying other things. And I think it's kind of, um, it's not as fun if you just immediately rule out something because uh, you think it's not going to be great for your particular language. Um, don't rule out Vim just because it doesn't ship with support for your favorite language. Go out and find the right plugin. And the cool thing about that is that um, a text editor like Sublime might not actually support like the most newest of languages. It really might not. And um, I think that if we had a Sublime user here, we might be able to get, get a confirmation of that fact. But in my example, it's definitely not going to support the language that I just wrote. And it's not going to support a lot of things. As soon as a language gets released, there's some Vim uh, programmers out there who are immediately starting to work on a, uh, a plugin for it. And I think if you believe in the open source model as I do, that that's a really good thing. Uh, use a plugin manager like Pathogen or Bundle. The reason I have so many language related plugins was it was just, it took me no time at all to find one and install it. And if you, if you get in a fast feedback cycle like that, then you uh, can try stuff out really quickly. And better tools equal better work. Can I answer any questions? Sure. Yeah. Okay, so we need to set we need to start over here. F type equals emerald source. Okay. What color scheme would you like to see? Uh, Railscast? I think Railscast is already here. Oh no, nice. So the colors are determined by the color scheme, not the Correct. So the color schemes, uh, they have a, e each color scheme has a color for um, a comment. Yeah. And Vim is saying, this is a comment color scheme. What color is it? And the color scheme turns into that color. I actually think um, color schemes and coloring in Vim would make a really awesome talk, even just a lightning talk, because it's something that I am really interested in, but I don't know a lot about. Um, there's a, like a lot of different ways to do it, and I, I don't, I definitely don't have a perfect system. But I'd love to, I'd love someone to come in and just, you know, really explain that topic well. Do you have, did you have another color in mind, Chris? No, that. Um, Is that perfect? Nice. <laughs> <laughs> I think that's my preference. What's up? I have a question, but it's, it's not for you because you already answered the question. Um, you, you were showing the, the Ruby motions, the, the different um, mappings yeah. for um, moving around a Ruby file. Yeah. And I, when we started, there were a couple of people that mentioned they used Ruby. So I'm wondering, you said you didn't use them. Do other people use them? How, how do you use them? The uh, motions or the type of subjects? The motions. Um, I use the, the M, the big M. Cool. Okay. Cool. Because I'm just wondering, like, there's the there's like the close bracket and open bracket end to like jump up and down um, methods, and I'm wondering if there's like any use cases for that. I don't know. Maybe just like cruising around the file. Like if you're doing a code review or something, or just trying to acquaint yourself. Well, yeah, with the just file. trying to acquaint yourself with the file, just to see where the, the methods are and what methods are in the file. Um, I think I think what I was thinking when I saw those things was that probably being able to move. So like a nested class would be really cool if there was like um, nested classes within your file. I've experienced that on plugins where you're like, I don't know if I'm in like, I don't necessarily know what class I'm in right now when you have nested classes in a, in a file. And um, yeah, so because I'm you, could, you could jump to the class header and then hit Control O to go back to where you were just for like a quick check of uh, what your context is. Yeah. I think they're good for, for, for reading. I, my only reason I don't use them is I forget that they're there. <laughs> like, it's not, it, that doesn't mean they're not really useful. I just, um, I didn't even, I kind of had forgotten about them until I started preparing for this talk. But I think they would be good for quickly reading source, source code, for sure. If you were going through some Ruby and wanted to read it quickly, yeah. 
You had a question, right? Yeah, I did. Um, did you find any good like resources for like the script when you were? I did. Let me um, go to my next slide. Okay, so here are some resources. Um, that was a great. That was a great leading question. <laughs> are you? Paul is actually a plant. Um, uh, so these are some resources that I found really useful. And I'll kind of try to zoom in out a little bit here. Um, so this is just the source code for this talk. It's all online. Um, Learn Vim script the hard way is really awesome. Um, this was my. This is a free online book. I think you can buy the book too. Um, but it's a. It's a really. It was like a go-to thing that I went to uh, when I was when I had questions. Um, I went through a wiki article when I was working on creating syntax highlighting files. Um, and that's also, again, this is all on GitHub, so you can go and check it out later. Um, this is that directory of Vim plugins that I think is, in, is, is really useful. Um, the Hashrock dot matrix is, our, is all of our dot files, and it has a lot of really good plugins already installed. So I would recommend checking that out. And then this is a directory of mine that I keep uh, a list of lots of things, but one of the things I list is uh, the Vim plugins that I like. And I did something um, fun for this project, which is um, I did a mapping that is in my VimRC that I'd like to show real quick. Uh, I think this is relevant to that question. Okay, so I did a normal mode remap between the F1 key and help, followed by Control R, which is the buffer for the, this is the buffer for the current word, and then enter. Yeah, the... Uh, so you're accessing your register, and then control a W is sort of the argument to control R. Um. Cool, thank you. Um, so, like, if you want to see that in action, like, let's say, and no remap. Okay, so I'm going to hit F1 on top of this. Uh, so that's just a shorthand for, for doing help and no remap. But uh, when, you, when I was... First diving into this, it was like I needed help on pretty much every word. So uh, <laughs> having not read like a Vim script book in the past or having much of a background on it, uh, I found that to be extremely useful. So I would, that mapping is, um, it's in my vimrc.local, but I could, po I'll probably post it in the meetup afterwards because it's good. Okay? Does it actually do the same thing or maybe that's a It sometimes does. So shift K is supposed to work with, um, like man pages. So if I do that, yeah. So that l opened up the BSD library functions manual. And I think that it sometimes is, a, I think it sometimes is a conflict with Vim stuff. It's supposed to work, um, but it was not working for me, so I did a, a remap. Can you, can you do the same example with no and no remap? Yeah. And no remap. Yeah, so um, I, think that there, I think there's a Vim setting out there that will make it work. Um, and I would like love for somebody to, f to post that afterwards if they'd like. Um, my, mine uh, was doing you know, the similar thing with a remap. It might be, can you just use tags for it? Like C tags? Like um, when they jump to the help file? Um, can we make you try everything? Yeah, let's uh, do it. Can you do uh, end, end no remap and then uh, control close bracket? Sure. Control. Oh, okay. yeah. I might have to yeah. generate the C tags first. Well, I, think, I don't think you can generate C tags for a help file. I think, I think you're right. Um, maybe. So my impression with C tags was that, that it had to be, um, and it actually might play into a link because uh, so when I run C tags on like a Ruby file, it would only tag the function names, or it won't tag like variable names or anything. So it must know something syntactically about the the Ruby language to to help C tags operate, but that's entirely outside of them. So. Um, 
right. Oh, no, there is a, there's a C tag con configuration file. Yeah. So you can configure C tags. Yeah. You could, could configure yeah, C tags yeah, to read your, yeah. help, your help file. Yeah. So for help information, um, to help and um, get help from the keywords is uh, pretty neat. You can use this uh, kind of way. So for example, I want to check the help information about like those uh, um, control or something, those like some shortcuts. Mm -hmm. So, uh, for example, I want to know uh, what is control W means in the in the command mode. So, then it's easy to get some information. For you. I think Josh might know how to do that. I don't though. Well, I tried to do that for this talk, and I ended up having to do a lot of Googling. The one easy way, if you're not totally sure what something is called, is and you can show this if you do colon uh, help grep. Yeah. Oh, yeah. And then you just oh. capital CTRL, oh. and then just hit that and see where that goes. Uh, oh, or nice. Or maybe try with dash W then. For, sorry, with CTRL dash W. Hmm. Uh, yeah, I want to see CW as well. C dash W. Yeah. Yeah, this was a. Hey. Yeah, nice. So it says one of one, but if there's multiple matches, you can jump in. It'll populate them in your. Uh, yeah. So this found, this grabbed it right, and it, it didn't give us like the end all be all definition for it, but it should be somewhere in the search results. Yeah, let's try that. Yeah, that's what we know. Okay. I think. Yeah, actually, actually. I think this is it. On the first page of the menu, help menu, it says if you want to check control something, just type a help C underscore and. Oh, that's. Yeah, that's, that's the tag that goes right there C underscore and control. Okay, got it. Gotcha. Command mode, sure. <laughs> Yeah, this is rendering really tough. Oh, yeah. oh sure. So the prepend. Yeah, Josh, you did talk about this, I think, recently. Um, yeah. If you want to look at something that's specifically in visual mode, you prepend it with a V underscore. Oh, yeah, yeah. That's really neat. Yeah, let's go back to that. Um, keyword is, uh, it is something that is like higher level in Vim. I, I, that's, I'm not sure how to, how to um, I'm not sure if I totally understand it to be honest. Uh, but let's look at my uh, emerald.vim. So syntax keyword, keyword means, um, it's like a it's like a direct link to something in Vim, which is a keyword. So a keyword. So you cannot use a, uh, like a rejecting keyword. It, it must be specified. Uh, I th right. I think you need to specify it directly. Keyword. That wasn't very good. Helpful man page. Um, let me let me look into that and see if I can give you a better answer afterwards. That makes sense though, right? Like keywords are kind of, um, all languages have keywords and they're these like very specific static things. Mm -hmm. And those are sort of distinct from s stuff that matches a certain pattern, like a, like a number or a string. I think that that's true. Any, uh, any other questions or final thoughts? Uh, on the bottom, like the 27? Yeah. Uh, that's how far down the file we are. No, no, no. He means right uh, true. I mean, it's in the last one. In your regex there. So uh, 
Yeah, any Vim Regex ninjas in here? Want to take a guess at that one? A backslash followed by a single character with no special meaning is reserved for future expansions. Huh. Okay. Uh, wait, did you type the percent as well? No, I was just looking. Uh, this site is uh, this buffer, like the whole buffer. Um, oh, it doesn't mean the current buffer. Yeah. Uh, I was thinking that too, ah, but it doesn't really make sense in that context. I think it's yeah. the right mix of like the cursor match position. this buffer true or false and highlight it. So, but in, in that regex, there's the there's the slash and the carrot, and then the slash and then the other carrot. I think that's just like contain whatever it's contained inside this this line. Right. Oh, I think it's this line. Yeah. Those mean it's uh, like a word. It's separated oh, oh, those by are those are word boundaries. Yeah, yeah, those yeah, are word boundaries. Yeah, that's, that's right. right. That's right. Is the percent the single means that something happening in the current line? Because you want you want only highlighted words mm -hmm. when you search something. And one you want you want, you, you want to highlight the one you, the word you searched mm -hmm. and you and what if those words happen to appear in different uh, different in the other lines? Yeah. So now I want to only highlight those words in the current time. So the I think the possessing both means only do the operations on the current line. I guess. Mm -hmm. Okay. Yeah. What happens if you have like true 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 true? Like in your MRL file? Yeah. Sorry, what? Well, uh, can you say that again? You go to your remote syntax file? Go to your remote file. Yeah. Like your source code file? Yeah, your source code. Yep. And then like highlight it, and then <laughs> when you say return true, return true, 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 true. Oh, sure. Yeah, let's do it. Looks like it's figured it out. Yeah. Um, so I think the uh, regex, there's so much to know. <laughs> um, <laughs> is there, uh, are there any other questions right now? I appreciate um, all the good questions and uh, it's a. Uh, I encourage you to check out the source code uh, online, and if you have any feedback for me, I would definitely appreciate it. I don't have in plans to write a Vim plugin anytime soon. Uh, like I said, all the languages that I like to write, uh, there already is a really good plugin, but uh, it's a it's a it's a programming challenge for anyone who would like to take it on. Um, that's all I got. Thanks a lot.